Hello everybody and welcome to the channel. In today's video we have a fantastic presentation by esteemed astrologer and author Michael Bartlett titled The Four Angles of Power, Cross of Incarnation. If you wish to view our current class, workshop and webinar offerings, please visit keplercollege.org. And without further ado, let's get into the video. On to today's fantastic presenter, Michael blends Western traditional esoteric and modern astrology. His core energetic training, highly intuitive nature, Three decades of business experience and two plus decades of astrological wisdom give him an extensively resourced toolbox. Michael is the author of two books, Astrological Mavericks, Do You Have What It Takes to Change the World? A book about individuals with planets on their chart angles and Astro Theatre, a revolutionary approach to the ancient art of astrology. A past interim president of Kepler College, Michael continues to contribute to webinars and workshops. He also offers experiential intensives reading, speaking engagements, coaching, and workshop intensives. And you can find out more about Michael at coremichael.com. So it's always a pleasure to have you back, and I'm going to pass on the baton to you. Thank you, Cal. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Kepler. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this Saturday. What a um, what a great gift, and so neat to see people from all around the world. So yeah, my name is Michael Bartlett, Master Metaphysical Astrologer. Thank you so much for being here today. And I'm going to be talking about the four angles of power, or what we also call the cross of incarnation. Um, feel free to ask questions throughout as you'd like. Um, just uh, type your question into the question and answer. And I think Cal will uh, let me know when people have something they want to say. All right. So what are the angles? We can consider it the cross of matter. And the circle around it is the wholeness of spirit. And we all exist in that middle point. And I'll be showing it a couple of times a little bit later as well. But when you think about it, if we take that cross out, then we just have that circle with a dot in the middle. What does that also represent as far as a glyph in astrology, but the glyph of the sun? So it's our self. It's our, you know, our true self, how we angle ourselves into the planet. So um, I like to look at the clock, I mean, the dial a little bit like a clock, so it makes it a little bit easy to represent where things are. So we're going to be talking about what the ascendant is, which is usually the sign or the position or a sensitive point within the sign at about nine o'clock on the chart. The IC or the MM Celli at six o'clock. The descendant or the DS at three o'clock. And the midheaven or MC or the medium Celli at 12 noon. So I'm going to go through a little bit of a more um, a practical and pragmatic approach, because I know for me, this is one of the parts that was really lacking in my understanding about um, the different circles that exist around our planet and how we understand astrology from that standpoint. And so when we begin with this, we're looking at the ascendant and descendant axis corresponding to the rise and with the sunrise on the eastern standpoint right here. And the Western horizon, which also represents the annual equinoxes, while the other pair is the ICMC axis corresponding to moon, noon and midnight, which is known as the meridian, as well as to the annual solstices. This it, it can kind of take a little bit to to grok this, and so um, I know for myself, I also get a little bit confused with it. Whenever we look, as we know, when we look at an astrological chart, we're looking at the reverse of how we would look normally at a map. Usually with a map, we have the north up at the top and we have west on the left-hand side, but these are all switched, of course, when we look at the astrological um, zodiacal birth chart or an astrological chart. So anything else I want to say on this? So yeah, so this is a meridian. And when we think about the one, the east, the west is the horizon. Now, one of the things that's really important, and I know it took me a while to understand this as well, is not to get the zenith confused with the medium chalet as well as don't get confused with the nadir as being the same as the Imam Chela. They are not the same. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more in direct, but you can see there's a lot of planes of existence with um, this being the prime vertical, which we were just showing a second ago with the um, MC, IC, descendant and ascendant. We are here. This is really actually this point, which we are with, if we think of where the earth resides or where we reside, I'm sorry, it's, went ahead a little bit quicker, um, is here in relationship to the outer sphere. The prime meridian is something that runs directly north and south. Direct, Actually, 
this is where it gets a little bit confusing where I don't even want to really kind of say north and south, but from pole to pole, because we have to remember that our earth is tilted at a bit of an angle, right? There's a little bit of a, um, an angle, which is what gives us our seasons and which um, gives us our ability to have, um, unless you live on the, um, around the equator is what gives us the nice uh, warm summers and the colder winters and the reverse in the Southern hemisphere. One way that's really nice and easy to consider, and you can actually stand up wherever you are, as long as you know where north is in your property or where, where you are living or where you're staying right now, if you stand up and you place your arms straight out and you face north, you're going to be having east on your right hand and you have west on your left hand side. And you're going to have south behind you and north in front of you. And again, this is considered the prime vertical or the east-west great circle. If you guys are making it so far through this, congratulations, because it's, it's really kind of, it's not the exciting part that we're going to get into in a little bit, but just it's, it's to hopefully give you a little bit of a frame of reference and um, an understanding of where we are in relationship to things. I think what happens a lot with astrology is it becomes very heady and we don't um, understand that, um, like our ancestors did before electricity, that we are an integrated aspect with the night sky, with the day, with nature, with all that is. We are not separate from. And so this is something that gives us back into and helps us to kind of get a reorientation with it. And so when we do that, um, the east-west great circle, what you can also do with your arms is like almost like a jumping jack is you can go with your hands and do an upward thing and you can see like oh this is this is that prime vertical going from the east to west as you go above your head and all the way down now when we talk about the meridian it's where we're going to be facing west so you're going to change your direction to the left and then of course then um Let's see, yeah. And then east is going to be behind you. South is going to be on your right-hand side and north will be on your left-hand side. I think I got that right, although something's clicking in my head that I'm not. So, But you can just check on it. It just gives you an idea. And again, you can do that similar thing of doing the circle and you'll get a sense of where that is. And then, um, and so that is where it comes back to where you can see there's a circle that actually holds the, uh, the meridian, which holds the zenith, the north, south, and the nadir. We have a circle that includes the prime vertical we have a circle which is the great vertical and then we have the circle which is the um east west north and south from where we are on the planet so um hopefully that makes a little sense um i'd really recommend i, I put this actually in the um in the notes as well i highly recommend uh ooh, let's see if we can get it Melanie Reinhardt, the great goddess of Chiron, uh, wrote a wonderful book called Incarnation, the Four Angles and the Moon's Nodes. Um, she took it from a couple of her talks that she gave. It gives a really great understanding and a presence of it if you want to get a little bit deeper in the understanding about what we just went through. All righty. So one of the things that I ran into um, when I wrote my book on astrological mavericks was how many people do not differentiate the angles from the houses and it looks like we have a question let me see um are you single whole yeah exactly thank you so that's exactly what i'm gonna be talking about nevenka so i appreciate you asking that um i personally use whole sign houses but the point that i'm making here is that the angles are not related to the houses except for the ways in which certain house systems begin their house system. Placidus Coke and numerous others, the ascendant is the beginning of the first house. And that's where I think a lot of people get a little bit of a, uh, get a little bit confused between the angles and the houses because in some of the systems they're kind of about one and the same. But as you know, as you go through the rest of the, um, the rest of the chart, it doesn't necessarily line up that way. So with whole sign houses, which I use, and I don't, and I'm not creating any, I'm not standing on a, on a pedestal and saying, this is the way you should do it or whatever. I think everyone learns um, the lens that works the best for them. I think uh, each of the house systems shows very particularized um, understandings of a person's chart. I love using Placis and Coke personally for um, psychological and emotional developmental issues that go on with individuals, but I like whole sign houses for a little bit more of a holistic aspect. And so then in whole sign houses, it's really simply a sensitive point within the sign. 
So this is what I was just saying a second ago. And what, and so um, so you can use it however you wish, but I just really need you to know that if, if there's nothing else you walk away from from the talk today, is that you understand first and foremost that Zenith and the MC are not the same, that Nadir and IC are not the same, and that um, the angles and the houses are not the same thing. Okay, that's like if that's the only thing you come away from this talk today, I'm I'm really happy, but I hope you come away with a lot more than that. <laughs> And as far as I've seen, I mean, I think there's what, something like 28 different house systems that go on. Um, everything that I've seen, the angles remain the same regardless of the house system. So this is something that doesn't change no matter what. Um, we're always going to see them roughly in that arrangement. I know like when I do the whole sign system, whole sign chart and I put up, which I'll be doing in a little bit, a lot of people get confused because they're like, wow, that ascend. I'm used to seeing that ascend in it exactly at nine o'clock, but instead it's actually just a little bit off down a little bit above or a little bit below, depending on, on how the placement is and how it shows up. Looks like we have another question. Uh, please see the author and the book you recommend, please. Yeah, actually, I, mean, I have a slide at the very end for it, Sandra, that actually has that, but I'm happy to say it again. Melanie Reinhardt, M-E-L-A-N-I-E-R-E-I-N-H-A-R-T. She also wrote an exquisite book on um, Chiron and also on the other. Um, so she also has a couple other ones on the Centaurs. All righty. So how I like to think about it is, I mean, well, we're going to be really kind of deep diving each of it. So I'm going to let it kind of unfold. Don't see another question. You're just saying, let's see, when you say MC is not Zenith, Zenith of what? Just not Zenith of the chart or also Zenith of the earth. Zenith of the earth. Yes, exactly. That's a really good question, Rachel. And that was the point with it. So if we go back to, let's see, we go back to that screen. We can see that, um, and actually even, because when we think of the earth being at a bit of an angle, yes, yeah, so it's really the highest point in relationship to the planet itself. Um, whereas the MC, because we usually think about the MC as being like high noon. Um, it's it's just as far as the relationship for as how the earth is tilted in that sense. So when we talk about the ascendant, it's vibrating at the frequency of what we project of ourselves for all to see, including who, um, including ourselves. Oh, we got a few questions there. Okay. Yes, they are tuning forks in the slide. Yes, thank you. And it's in a question when I registered, will that be seen? Um, you're going to need to type in here under the q and Iana, Iliana, sorry, if that's okay. Oh, Lori's going to answer. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So yeah, these are tuning forks because I really see each of the angles as being a vibratory system that is operating and acting as a means of either electrically... Um, sending out pulses if it's a um, a masculine sign or a negative sign as we talk about in astrology or uh, drawing to it through magnetic pulses as in the feminine signs or the positive uh, the positive signs um so yeah so how we are vibrating at, at a certain frequency of ourselves so whatever that sign is there and especially that that degree is going to be vibrating of who we are and it's, and it's sending out a pulse into the collective or wherever we are whatever we're doing the IC is vibrating at the frequency of our inner self. The descendant is vibrating at the frequency of what we project onto other, right? Our viewpoint of other. It isn't necessarily who we, what we, I mean, usually it is what we end up drawing to ourselves because it is what we're projecting out into the environment. So that's the frequency that we're putting out there as far as like looking for someone. Uh, for whole sign, are you using zero degrees for all houses? No, that's that doesn't even play into that, Jane. So I'm not sure what you're saying. Um, so what we're talking about right now are the angles. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, let's do that, Heather. Let's yeah, let's save that to the end because I think it does disrupt it a little bit. So Jane, if you can hold on to your question in the end and everyone else, that'd be really great because then I can get kind of through a little bit and then we can do it. I know there's a lot of it. And again, feel free to email me at michael at quormichael.com. If for some reason you don't get your question answered during the talk, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. And then the MC, of course, is then vibrating at the frequency of what our path projects out to the world. These are not necessarily conscious projections of our energies. These are a series of unconscious energies. These are the frequencies of the sign that is near those angles or that, that that the angles reside in, as well as if there are any planets that are going to be heightening that as well. 
So um, another way to look at it is we think of this as sunrise here at the eastern horizon where that ascendant is. And you can see that here we're talking about here's the whole sign of Virgo. This is that sunrise is happening while um, while it's in Virgo. So this is where the ascendant is. This whole sign, how I look at it is the first house, but you can also look at it from the first house going forward, depending on your sign system. But again, we're not worrying about house systems here. We're really simply looking at what the angles are. And I know it's really, a ch it's really, I think because, because we've anchored some of our house systems to the angles, I think it's really hard for people to understand that they are actually doing two separate things. Um, the beginning of the first house and the ascendant are two separate things, except for in certain house systems. Maybe that's a clearer way to say that. So for a day birth, we're always going to see that sun above the horizon somewhere here. The horizon is the sunrise to sunset line. So it's going to be somewhere around there. This is going to be what we call a day birth. Automatically, when you look at a person's chart, you can be able to tell that person was born during the day. I also like to see the sunset and sunrise periods. The ascendant and descendant is being liminal. Whenever anyone has their sun, their moon, or other planets around those um, sunrise and sunset or the ascendant and descendant, there is this sort of a liminality. These people are able to kind of go back and forth between both sides very easily. Day birth, this is a night birth that's happening under the horizon. Again, a night birth because you're still under the horizon line. And what really brought me originally to the whole part of angles and astrological mavericks was something that I, I kept seeing over and over again. And that was that whenever anyone had planets near or on or just after the ascendant, um, that really marked a person's birth. Um, it either marked the birth process or it actually might even physically mark the individual. Um, because what we know is here, this where this ascendant line is, is this space above the ascendant line is pre-birth. That means we are still merged with mother. We're not a separated, individuated self. And then we jump into, um, let me go back before this happens. And, um, and then when we are born, this is when we take our first breath and we find differentiation. The zodiac goes in a clockwise direction when we're looking at the chart and the planets go in a counterclockwise direction and we're getting a lot of um yes okay so we answered that nina yeah i think michael just for the the sake of the, yeah. the presentation uh, yeah. maybe we just let some of these questions pile up and then maybe stop a little bit later i think that might Perfect. be better yeah if you want to okay. handle that for me i'd i'd really appreciate that yeah Wonderful. and then I'm, we'll, we'll yeah. get to and we yeah. can maybe have a q a at the end or something like that but thank you all yeah for we definitely and uh sorry yeah, yeah we'll continue. definitely sorry. have time and actually thank you so much it's really exciting and i can just see just by everyone's question that there is a lot of confusion in this area for it and what the need is for us understanding this i'm going to move this on because it's getting a little dizzy making here <laughs> but um yeah it's it's really um the cross is what really is our interrelated self in relationship from the earth out into the planets and so it it really talks about what our key relationships are for each of us in our life each of our angles so we've got our wheel again with the ascendant I see all the way around birth moment, like I said before, which I believe is the face of and for the self. The I see is the face of and for the family. You know, it's that part of ourselves that is not only um, that family from which we came, but also how we internalize our family and ourselves. And we go forward with that, um, even though we're not, um, we're no longer with our family. We've gone out into the world on our own. The descendant is the face of and for the other, and the midheaven is the face of and for the public. I mean, it's kind of another way you can kind of look at it is like these various masks we wear. And so whatever signs appear where our ascendant, I see, descendant, and midheaven are, those are really kind of the faces we offer to the world or the way and the ways in which we see those things. So um, the first house of crime, I mean, the ascendant, of course, is how the world meets me and how I meet the world. And it's basically this fundamental aspect of who am I? There's going to be a flavoring of it. Of course, it has to do with Aries because it is um, always has that flavoring sort of underneath it. Um, and one of my favorite ways of looking at the ascendant 
is if you consider being in a colored glass house or a greenhouse, let's say it's a blue greenhouse, a, a blue greenhouse. Yeah, that makes it sound funny. A blue greenhouse where the glass is all blue. When you look out into the world, everything you see is going to be blue. And anyone who looks in and sees you inside of that glass building is going to be seeing blue. So that's just really gives you an idea of how strong our lens is on that ascendant. So say, you know, in the case of a traditional ascendant, and like how I'm going to count it here is with Aries. So when a person has an Aries rising sign, when their ascendant is Aries, what most people are going to pick up right away with that individual is an Aries feeling, an Aries sensation, an Aries, like when we talked about the tuning forks earlier, that the way that they're going to be vibrating in a certain way. And that's also how the individual is going to be seeing out into the world. It's going to be really perceived as the world is that. It's very primary. It's very um, instinctual. It's very, um, and, and again, not again, but some of the things that are really important about what astrology gives us is the opportunity to observe and not be so caught up in that sign on our ascendant that we aren't able to understand that there are other ones around, that are other ascendants that operate in certain ways, or there are other different things that go on. Um, it's this understanding and be able to see and observe how these energies work. And so I'd really welcome you with all of this that I'm sharing. Um, these have been my experiences over the past couple of decades and the work that I've done. And I'd really welcome people to go out and, and ask those questions and see how they perceive them. And also, you know, how it resonates for yourself is always what's really crucial and important. All right. The IC or the um, MM Shelley, how I meet my inner family and how my inner family self meets me. How we get to be ourselves behind closed doors. It's that more that really privacy or, and also where do I come from? It really says a lot when we look at a person's, um, I see that they, um, it's really, really going to describe what the home style home experience might've been like when they were growing up. And by the way, a lot of these images I'm using are from my book, Astro Theater. This is the image we use for the fourth house, uh, with a little pond inside and a crab and very Cancerian and homey. So um, that really kind of that sense of where we kind of go back and we are our own private selves there in that IC realm. The descendant is how I meet other and how other meets me. Or who am I in relationship to you? Right. The chart is always telling us what that individual is seeing. And it's also very interesting because as we understand with astrology, with so many of the polarities that are involved, it's real easy for us just to project onto other people. And so really getting to understand who someone else is and not what our projections are of that other person is a really powerful um, shifting point in our ways of being in relationship to other people. The um, MC, how I meet my path and how my path meets me, or why did the um, why did the mountain goat cross the road? <laughs> what is my path in life and how the public sees my work? And also, where am I headed? It's like what is, what is my what is my projected goal through? Um, Life is this very interesting way of um, through very subtle ways of choices that we make and actually sometimes even more aggressive and, and direct choices that we make, we eventually find ourselves on the path of what we're doing. And when we look back, we can see the grace with which those things all fell into place. But when we're in it, sometimes it isn't all that clear and understandable. But um, through the gift of astrology, we're able to kind of see uh, the likelihood of how, what someone's going to be picking, what someone's going to be choosing, how they're going to be moving forth in their public life period. Um, in um through their in mid heaven i really like this diagram from nick anthony fiorenza that breaks down the chart um so we really get to see by how the quadrants are so if we think of the first quadrant from the ascendant to the ic is the introverted self quadrant self values how we think and feel the second quadrant is introverted other. So that's when we're starting to make that connection, right, with other people. We're relating to our family and getting ready to relate to some people outside of our family. So it's domestic environment, family, creativity, and work. Then we move into the next quadrant, which goes from the descendant to the midheaven, which is the extroverted other quadrant, right? This is where we really make those connections with other people and we make our commitments and we're really out there in the world in a certain way. Again, this is uh, moving from personal focus to an internal focus down here at the IC. Now we've moved to an interpersonal focus. And then we finally come up to the midheaven where it's an external focus. And that next quadrant is the extroverted self 
quadrant and the personal pursuit and professional achievement, or in what I like to think of the transcendental part, right? The um, from the tenth through the twelfth houses, and how um, we've stepped into because if we think about each of the houses, um, even though the chart talk we aren't really talking about houses as much, but when we move from the ascendant all the way back to itself, we're talking about also a developmental process of becoming for ourselves. Whew. Yeah, and again, here's the sun. So it's really understanding that, you know, we are here at that center part. And um, another wonderful aspect about astrology is to teach us about integration, synthesis, and cohesiveness. And so um, depending on how sophisticated one's chart is and everything and how things play out, sometimes it takes us a little bit of time to be on the planet working with our energies and being able to understand how to integrate these in, in, a, in a beautiful way. So um, I like to see it as like, you know, it's it's the act of becoming. And then for some of us, depending on the kind of work we've done or what we're doing in this lifetime, I also firmly believe that one can transcend one's chart and then be working towards um, what's coming up. It doesn't happen very often for people, but sometimes people are really well set up, they get their work done, and they can really kind of get, you know, it's kind of a bonus round, which is kind of what this lifetime is when you think about it compared to so many lifetimes in the history of humanity, our ability to connect with one or one another as we're doing right now, um, or physically through boats, uh, planes, trains, and automobiles. Um, it's a very interesting time of being able to connect with soulmates and soul brothers and sisters in a way that we haven't um, been able to do for many, many, uh, many many, many lifetimes. All righty. So actually this might be a good, um, this might be a good question break time if that's okay, Cal. Okie dokie. Yeah. We've got some questions coming in. Let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, what orb are you using to consider something on an angle? Well, that's really interesting. And it really kind of gets more into when I give my talk on the astrological mavericks. And what I found to be very fascinating when I did my research on it is I started out by um, when I put my tabulations in solar fire, um, it was basically, a, you know, if, if a planet, um, in this sign, um, and certain, um, and then, but I didn't realize until afterwards is that I end up having wide orbs in some of the outer planets. I typically like to keep like more of like a five degree orb, but what I found to be very interesting, it wasn't until I got into Mercury and then realized that my, um, that my orbs were sometimes larger. They were like 10 degrees on some of the outer planets. And I thought that was a little bit wide. But what I found to be very fascinating about that is that when we talk about maverick placements for people, is that it, it's any time the planet is in the same sign as one of the angles. The only time, and this is actually what all my work was, was in the same sign, same angle. But I also have to share, just because I've had numerous people come up to me um, during talks um, or during readings and shared with me, if you have your any of your angles at a very late degree of a sign, excuse me, or a very early degree of a sign, and you have a planet on that other sign really close to the angle, it still has an effect. There's just something very powerful of it. And actually, I really, I'm going to leave this quote up here by Alan Leo, because I just think it's so, um, it says a lot about it. And I haven't been able to run across too many people who talk about the angles very much, but he says the influence of the angles is very similar to cardinal signs, meaning that they're all about making things manifest can concrete and bringing out into the world, whatever has been lying latent in the personality. And what I found over and over again, regardless of what the orb was, however tight it was, or however wide it was, that simply that that closeness, and especially with the same sign and the same angle, there was just um, the saying that kind of came to my head is these individuals cannot help but X, Y, and Z. I have Mars in my midheaven. I can't help but be very Martian in my approach to life. I mean, it's that's what people feel. So like in that beginning um, uh, slide that I have with the tuning forks, I vibrated a frequency that some people really, it's going to be very irritating because it's like my Mars is that they're at the front and people are feeling that pushing energy all the time. I don't feel that in myself because it's me. Like we say, you know, we don't know who discovered water, but it probably wasn't Pisces. <laughs> it's, um, you know, we we live in these energies strongly enough. So I hope they, hopefully that answers you on the on the orb question. Wonderful. I'm with you, Michael. Mars on the angle too. I totally resonate. Wonderful. We have you a understand. few questions on uh, talking about the liminal part again. A couple of maybe to expand on what you were talking about there. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Liminality is this wonderful liminality. Um, if we think of uh, the word liminal, it's really, um, it's a threshold. 
So when we think about, and this is actually really interesting, it's, it's interesting, it's kind of giving me goosebumps actually, um, because here we're, we're talking about these thresholds, these angles are actually really energetic thresholds. And so in a sense, I can see how some of the house systems have aligned with using these uh, these angles as the sh thresholds for the um for the um for the houses because th when you think about a, a liminality is this ability when i think about it when you think about dusk and dawn many people who talk about um the subtle energies people who work with nature people who um, are very much 12th house scorpio pisces um kind of water oriented souls there's something very special about the dawn and the um, and dusk, the t the two twilight periods. Things slide through from both sides. There's there's something that allows for that which is in the shadows to be kind of caught and glimpsed, so to speak. And so that's what I mean by liminality. Wonderful, fantastic. I think we can carry on now. And I forgot to say at the beginning of the presentation, please refrain from using your own natal chart information. If you want to more, ask more general questions, that's great as well. But that's probably better for a workshop. <laughs> so I think that's great. Yeah, or a can, reading. Uh, we can yeah. rock and roll and continue. <laughs> yeah, or a reading. You know, this is actually, I really love working with people. Um, I, I offer readings on Maverick placement because what what happens is with people when people have powerful planets on the angles it really has to do with what the relationships are with other planets um to see how powerful it's getting presented and also ways to i don't want to say tame it because i really don't like the idea of it thinking that it needs to be tamed one of the powerful aspects about it is that it's this is really untamed energy and very um very instinctual in a sort of way because of the powerfulness of the personal aspect of the angles being involved. Um, and so I like to work with people and really empower them to, um, to, for what their particular placement is and, and work with that. So, okay. So yeah, this is, I really like Alan Leo's and I highly recommend um, esoteric astrology book that he wrote very, um, actually a lot easier to um, grok and get a glimpse of than um, Alice Bailey's work. Um, but it, very nice. But I really like that he really captures this point. There's something very powerful in the aspect of what the angles are. All right. And so when we think about it too, the uh oh, I just accidentally muted myself. <laughs> so think of it as each of the angles representing our personal views and perspective for ourselves, for our family, other, and career. Um, right now with Pluto and Aquarius, we're really starting to see these clashes of interpersonal, um, societal uh, perspectives and what that means and the need and the desire for people to cohere together under a certain level of being societally focused, right? Um, the the thing that standing that, sorry, this looks like it just paped out again, um, that the... Um, the understanding of how the specialness of the self is also of how the self that everyone else is also special and how all of us as special beings then make up a collective and what we can do from that standpoint. But it's just really under, it's really good to understand that basically this, these four points, the, um, the ascendant, I see descendant and MC just really represent our kind of a framework our like antenna out in the world uh, with those four signs that each of us bear on those and how we then perceive and receive information uh, and interact with people. So when you think about, it, I really like to think of it as a lens, like I talked about earlier on with that, with that ascendant being like the color of the greenhouse and that, how that affects it. Um, and it really makes sense when we meet different people and some people we can meet and we can immediately have a distaste for or a reaction to because um, we maybe they um, we might have a um, our I our I C information you know who we are as an I C you know down at the bottom of the chart and wanting to be a little bit more private may be a lot more sensitive when we meet someone who's a lot more gregarious and a lot more strong willed in that place and how that then affects us and um, doesn't allow for us to um, feel as safe as we'd want to at that at that spot and it can explain you know sometimes with um, interpersonal reactions why we can just sometimes just by the mere presence of certain people we can actually just feel unsafe because of what might be vibrating again go back to that tuning fork thinking thinking sending out that energy so um the angles make these signs and in their point 
planets or planets there in personal to each of us. I, I believe it really gives us a very, um, uh, what's the right way to say? We, uh, it's almost like that, and especially when, because when you think about it, conjunctions are um, a new birth. Um, they are also almost like a Siamese twin. There's a conjoined energy about it. And so when we have these um, planets on any of our angles, it's literally like we're carrying forth that planet of expression out into the atmosphere, as well as the sign itself. And any point, so like if we have our North Node there, our South Node there, if we have um, Black Lilith, or if we have um, our Daemon, although usually the Daemons don't end up going that far north um, on the chart, north and south, at, um, or on the angles, they're a little bit in between. So, so along with the nodes, they show us our relationship to both the personal and collective. Um, so we'll get into some chart action here. Um, one of the people who kind of inspired me when I did my Astrological Mavericks book was Michel Gauguin, who approached astrology from the standpoint of being a skeptic. So he went and he decided to access uh, these 25,000 individuals in the Europeans listing of who's who and did all of their birth charts and saw what their careers were to see kind of what their, what, you know, what was playing out. And like Cal and I with our Mars, our strong Mars placements, the Mars on the mid have intended to show that there was something that um, usually um, track star, or not track stars, but sports stars, people who really kind of go out and go and have this certain kind of a, a particularized way of doing and interacting in the world. He found that there was a higher than normal statistical um, relevance. So meaning that it was happening more than statistically would allow for it. And he went on to um, write several books on astrology and between him and his wife, Francoise, um, um, to, to learn and to further understand it and see it. So very interesting way and very interesting because, oh, darn it, I thought I had my little loopies there. And we can see with him, he has Jupiter conjunct his midheaven just three degrees away in the sign of Taurus. He also has Mercury conjunct his IC in Scorpio. And Francois said that he was a bit of a medieval tyrant and not that easy to live with. <laughs> and you can kind of see that, right? When you think of Jupiter and Taurus, that um, that kind of demand for um, so much in a sense, you know, that nothing is too much to ask for in a sense. And then that Mercury and Scorpio down below in the fourth house. And what was he? He was a phenomenal researcher, right? That Mercury and Scorpio gave him um, kind of steroids in, in the ability to research and find out about this. Um, according to my friend, Aaron Sullivan, who just passed away in December, blessings to her soul. Um, she um, knew Francoise and Michelle very well, and she said that actually a lot of his work actually was Michelle uh, was Francois's work. <laughs> so unfortunately, you know, we're talking about a time back then when um, men were still uh, a little more in the front than women, and um, and she, so he got a little bit more of the respect from it. Something that not many people do know, and it's very interesting. And one of the things that I found about this uh, in my work with the uh, with the Mavericks. Especially when it came to Mars on the midheaven, um, <laughs> which I have as well. Um, there are there have been people who that there's there have been blows to the head. People die from um, tr blunt blunt force trauma to the head a lot of times. So sometimes these can be, as we know, when it comes to astrology, unfortunately, very quite literal in the way they represent themselves. Um, Michel Gauguin, um, which I don't know if it's much of a public record, but he actually did commit suicide. Um, he's got Jupiter in Taurus. He did it um, privately. Um, he told all of his friends he would be somewhere else. Um, so everyone thought he was with someone else. And by the time they figured it out, um, it'd been something like a week or, or longer um, when they found his body. So it was really, really unfortunate. Sorry, I don't, <laughs> my Scorpio, and I apologize. I can get a little dark and moody at times. Samuel Reynolds is a brilliant um, Sam Reynolds. He lives now here in Santa Fe, which is great. Um, one of the other astrologers who I've seen talk about this, and he says, angularity gives singularity. And I love the simplicity of that line because it really does. There's just a way in which these planets then get highly presented um, when they're near that. Um, 
So Sam is a maverick who come to astrology again, kind of like um, like uh, Michel Gogolin, where he came as a skeptic, but now is not only remained interested, but is also a um, world-renowned astrological teacher, speaker, advocate, and mentor. And he has Jupiter conjunct his descendant in Virgo. Brilliant human being. All righty. Da, 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 da. So when I went and wrote this, what I did, just so you guys kind of know, kind of what kind of resources are out there and what's available because it is really fascinating for me. And all of a sudden I got this idea. I was talking with, um, I worked with a, an astrologer here in Santa Fe named Tom Brady, who, um, not the, not, not the football star, <laughs> but he, um, I learned from him as far as like with these plants and everything. Like he had Saturn on his ascendant at birth. He was taken away from his mother, put in an incubator. So it really brought me up with this idea right off the bat that there was something going on with the angles. Um, and I saw placements that happened a lot more with the ascendant and the midheaven, and then was realizing that, wow, why isn't there much going on with the descendant and the IC? Well, what I found out was that um, that there are people that have that, and I'll be showing some examples in a little bit, that are just as powerful when there. So there is really this inability to hide this energy, I would say. So I went through and I made my little listing and I said, okay, we've got to do sun through each of the signs for each angle. So there's going to be 48 points per planet that I cover in the book, which gives a really nice nuanced thing. It's not just simple planet sign um, house kind of a structuring of it. Um, I use 11 planets, um, which includes Chiron. So it gives 132 positions between them between the signs and the planets. And then what I did is I went into, um, as I said earlier, I went into solar fire. I did a search for people based on each of the placements. So I would do if sun in Aries, if um, Aries ascendant, um, and I think there was maybe even a third one that I had to ask. And then it would just give me these sets of names. And my idea was that we should know th that any of the individuals that would come up that their name would be synonymous with these planets on that angle. And as I'm going to show in a couple of, uh, of moments, um, it's it's really kind of um, <laughs> mind-blowing, as only astrology can be, as you know. Um, so it gives a total of 528 placements, um, oftentimes with 2 to 12 archetypal examples per sign, I mean, per um yeah, per placement. But what I need to say, of course, is that prior to 1940 here in the States, um, and I'm not sure what it is in different countries, but prior to that time, the birth time was not necessarily recorded. And because of this, the birth time, what's required in order to know your angles is, is the birth time, birthplace, and birth date. And these three points give us an exactitude of how then that ascendant is lined up, because that's what it really is, is affecting whatever that it, that's whatever's rising on the eastern horizon at the time of our birth is technically that which is, is flavoring that. Um, so before 1942, um, I don't have as many exactness. Um, it really gets into this placement of people who either were nobles or um, were wealthy or um, or had some other reason for having it. So um when we get to the outer planets, such as Neptune and Pluto, and even with Uranus, actually, you notice it a little bit more. There's there's more blank spaces when we get into Pluto, just because we don't I don't have the anecdotal information. So then, what I would do after that is I would go in, and I would put in this person's information into Google or one of the search engines on the web, and I would look for quotes. Obituaries were really wonderful. Um, if they were an actor or an actress, um, some of the roles they've played. Um, and if they were a singer or musician, um, what some of their songs were. And then usually those also just completely lined up with the presence of what these alignments were as well. So I'll get into some examples now, which are really fun. One of my favorite ones and what I think is really powerful and important to understand is that these are, I keep using powerful, right? That's a, you know, that's the title of the talk today because they really are powerful placements. If a person isn't getting the right sort of reflection from their family and from their um, society, there are ways in which the energies are not going to be healthily expressed, right? So here's an example of it. On the right here, we have Richard Carpenter. On the left, we have Ted Bundy. Richard Carpenter of the Carpenters, for those of you who remember those songs back from the, you know, <laughs> love is never having to say you're sorry kind of days of the 70s. Um, some of the songs he wrote was I Won't Last a Day, 
without you, hurting each other, and yesterday once more. And it's kind of funny when you read them all together. I won't last a day without you hurting each other yesterday once more. <laughs> but those are all actually individual songs. Um, and this is a quote by Ted Bundy. I'm the most cold, cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever meet. We serial killers, killers are your sons. We are your husbands. We are everywhere. And there will be more of your children dead tomorrow. I don't think anyone doubts whether I've done some bad things. The question is what, of course, how, and maybe even more importantly, why? I think you can kind of understand the placements we have here. <laughs> We're talking about Scorpio. Um, Richard has a stellium in Scorpio with Venus, Mercury, Mars, and Jupiter. It's quite a strong force of nature, so to speak, there. Um, and Ted Bundy has three planets in Scorpio with two being retrograde which I think can really share a lot about the insights of not only his understanding of processing things and what he thought was okay to get away with, with that Mercury retrograde, but also his understanding and his value and appreciation of how he saw women, I think is also really highly indicated by this uh, Venus retrograde as well. And then he's got Jupiter. And both of them have this down here at the IC. So this is an example of how that, um, that even when things are being expressed down at that IC, even when we think that it's behind closed door, our private self that no one is ever really going to see, mm -hmm. that this energy is vibrating. This energy is sending out information into the world. And here we have a similar placement as well, right? Because we remember if we had Michel Gauguin, he has his Mercury retrograde, which is that research element I was talking about that was down here on his IC. The other ones um, that are interesting that have kind of placements of this IC too are um, uh, OJ Simpson. I think he, OJ Simpson and Elton John both have, I believe, Jupiter conjunct their IC in Scorpio. And for those of you who um, like movies, I really like movies because sometimes they really encapsulate these images in such a powerful way. But um, in Rocket Man, there's this scene when Elton starts getting. Um, starts becoming famous and he, there's this interesting montage where he kind of rolls into a Rolls Royce and he's offered cocaine and sex and drugs and all kinds of stuff. And it's like, to me, that was just like the perfect, like, um, what do I want to call it? Mosaic of what, <laughs> what Jupiter and Scorpio on the IC would be about, you know, and the man's still alive and he's quite a testament as a human being. Um, so, um, why do we call it the four powers, the, the four angles of power, the cross of incarnation is because when you have the ability to be present, and I talked about this a little bit earlier on with this integration aspect, when you're able to be present with the energies of each of your angles, you've gained the power to be who you are and adjust life as you need. The cross is two polarities, right? And when we think of polarities, we automatically think of Aries, Libra in astrology when we think of polarities, because that's our primary polarity that we work with, Right. And the most important thing I think that is that is to understand about the Aries, Libra, or any polarity is not to be, if we think of Aries as being, say, absolute white and Libra being absolute black, coloring-wise, the goal isn't to understand what absolute white and absolute black are, but to absolutely understand the gradation of gray from the lightest shade of of white to the darkest shade of white and from the lightest shade of black to the darkest shade of black and being able to access whatever that point is we need along the continuum as we need it to be able to respond to life in an appropriate manner. Now, of course, in this space, I'm not even talking about whether someone has fixed angles, whether they have cardinal angles or whether they have uh, mutable angles. It's just simply that sense of being able to reside in the middle of ourselves. It's very much like a meditative practice when we think about it, sitting at the center of ourselves and allowing the information, these tuning forks to give us information and to send out information. And as we grow into ourselves and we feel more comfortable in who we are, that takes some time to do, or stepping away from family dynamics or relationship dynamics that have prevented us from really understanding who we are. Um, anything that allows, that's why I think meditation is such a crucial role, um, walking out in nature, whatever, whatever it is it gives you that feeds you is really important for getting to understand who you are in relationship to life. Um, getting you back into contact with yourself is really crucial. All right. Ah, so in esoteric astrology, we call the um, cross of incarnation, it shows three levels of human development. I also teach esoteric astrology just as, as an aside and work with it. Um, 
the uh, mutable cross represents unconscious unity or where we are completely residing in what we say personality or our self desire nature where there really um where there isn't really an understanding that there's a duality we're just really being who we are we don't really understand that there's anything larger than ourselves we um can also in some ways Let's see. Yeah, I think probably the best way to say is desire driven, because in order to step onto or away from a sense of our personality and being um, stuck into our own sense of self, we have to understand that there are others besides ourselves, kind of like what I was talking about earlier when we were talking about Aquarius and with Pluto being there, we're going to be really going through a lot of re-understanding about ourselves and who we are as humanity. Uh, the second cross is going to be this the fixed cross, which is the conscious duality, which is understanding the um, going from initials to advanced stages of consciousness of personality and soul relationship, understanding that we are a soul having a physical experience that we're kind of in this meat suit, so to speak, that there's something larger in us that is connected to something greater that allows for the understanding of synchronicity, you know, being in the right place at the right time, which um, when um, Carl Jung started working on his um, theory of uh, synchronicity, um, what he loved about astrology, and he did charts on every single one of his clients, was understanding that astrology showed the closest um, representation of how synchronicity works. So it's um, where we really understand and begin to uh, make conscious the idea of duality, right? Understanding that um, there is a me and there is the greater we and that we're all connected. Um, something I talked about a little bit earlier on was this separation of ourselves from the sense of nature, from the night sky, from the understanding of how we are in relationship on the earth with nature and the planet and the stars. Um, this is then we step into this conscious duality. I would say that I would probably say the vast majority of you all here are somewhere in this conscious duality aspect of the fixed cross because you understand that there's something a little bit more. Otherwise, you wouldn't be looking at a, a system like astrology that gives an understanding of, um, of um, the organizational ways in which humanity expresses itself throughout time and space. <laughs> And conscious unity is when we step into this place of the cardinal cross where the soul is completely centered and it holds the duality within the greater understanding of oneness. Um, I would think that many of us in this room have it, um, can have maybe an inkling of what that may be like. Some of us in this room maybe even have that ability and are able to be in it. But when we're in this place of conscious unity, we no longer forget who we are. I believe that sin, S-I-N, is most of what most of the religions talk about is um, when you think about it in Latin and a lot of the Latin, uh, Latin and a lot of Latin languages, sin just means without and without is forgetfulness. It's when we forget who we are and the Maya of being in this physical body with the amount of energy that we get bombarded by on a daily basis makes it sometimes challenging to remember who we are in the middle of this, who's observing, who's experiencing, who is in relationship to what's going on in life. And this is really probably 1% of the population of humans who really are able to sit in this place of conscious unity 100% of the time. I mean, we're talking Dalai Lama, some of these monks are just sitting in that place of where they're able to just sit in the center of the all that is and not be disturbed ever. Really powerful placement to be. The other thing that plays in when we talk about the angles and what I love about it, um, I really highly recommend if you don't have a membership with astro.com, you can have free, you can pay for a membership on that. But when we are, and when you think about back to those earlier images I showed with the different circles that are going on, there's also a way in which each of us has a map for who we are on the planet. I know Kepler has some really phenomenal classes for, um, for astrocartography, and it can really show you different experiences. What I like with astro.com, there's a thing in there called uh, something like astro free, astro click free travel or something like that. And I don't know about you, but I love getting on there sometimes and just clicking. You can click by continent, it'll do by, you know, here's one that does the whole world. And um, the next one I have is, um, is this one which shows it this way as well. And then you can also do it by continent or country and align it. And all you have to do is click on the city where you live or different cities where you've been, and it'll give you a brief paragraph on the experiences you're likely to have. 
it's it's uncanny. I mean, I, I can't even explain to you. Um, it really draws out that energy of it. And when you think about it, however your birth chart is and whatever, for those of us who have planets in our angles, what type of experience we had in those places where we were born, there was that intensity already with it. And we probably moved to different places and then different intensities get activated for who we are. Like I know, like when I'm in Lisbon and when I'm in Portugal, I have Jupiter on my um, on my ascendant. I love Portuguese food. I'm half Portuguese, so um, I know that probably one of the things that would probably happen for me with Jupiter and Taurus is that I would probably gain a lot of weight because I probably would just continue to stuff myself with the the loving food there. <laughs> so, um, so here's Melanie's book. It's called Incarnation: The Four Angles and the Moon's Nodes. I also really highly recommend for those of you who are studying Chiron and any of the other uh, centaurs, she just has an amazing amount of information and work on it. Um, Melanie's also, besides being a traditional astrologer, she's also an esoteric astrologer too. So she just has this depth of understanding and perception and the way that she holds the relationship of understanding who we are as physical beings. Um, so I'm just going to do two little um, two little announcements, and then we'll go into full on question and answer mode. Um, on um, the eighth, seventh, and eighth of let's see, eighth of Jan, no, eighth of March, I'm going to be giving a talk in Tucson on this on um, astrological mavericks, and then on the ninth, I'm going to be doing a workshop. I really enjoy doing the workshops because I do this thing like I do with the reading, but I just really do it in a quick kind of tight manner because it depends on how many people are showing up, but I can kind of say like how to activate and work with your maverick, um, especially if you tell me the kind of issues you're having with it and why it isn't working for you. So um, this is also going to be recorded, so you can do it by Zoom if you're not going to be per uh, and present for it for the talk on, on that Friday. I recommend for you to go to my website, coremichael.com, and you will receive your 2024 retrograde calendar for signing up to my mailing list. This is an example of my 2023 calendar that kind of just shows you what's going on for the year for where the retrograde seasons are. And I think I will just leave this up, which is all my social media stuff, so you can keep up that. And I am... That is my talk, and I am happy to answer and take questions until um, until we're tired of it. <laughs> Michael, absolutely brilliant as always. You're having so many comments and coming in and hearts and claps. So thank you so much. <laughs> it's a great. I mean, it's a fun time. I mean, it's really the what excited me about it. Like when I first to do this talk, I. Oh. I think it came undone again. I'm sorry, my little pin. My, um, I can't actually see the screen for all the hearts uh, and everything coming through. <laughs> yeah, no, this is beautiful. Thank you all so much. Yeah, I remember years ago when I was starting to write the book, and I was in um, in Bali with Alan Oaken and um, and Nuno Michaels, and I was telling him about what I was doing, and he just like looked at me, and his eyes got really big, and he says do you understand the contribution you're doing for astrology? And like, I didn't even, cause I actually was just in the beginning of it. And I didn't even understand like what kind of a crazy thing. The, the book is a thousand pages, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's almost a weapon. <laughs> But it's one of those things. I, 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 yeah. I think we've got <laughs> the, so the links in the description as well for your books. And uh, if you want to go there, go and purchase them. Absolutely brilliant. Wonderful. <laughs> Fantastic. So are you ready for an extensive Q&A? Because we have so many insightful questions coming in. So yes. are, are we ready to Please. go? <laughs> yep, definitely. Let's go for it. Wonderful. So this is not a chronological order. We're just picking out questions here. So uh, let's see. How do you use progressed angles? Well, that's such a great, um, let's see, progressed angles, angles. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. I mean, that's, that's I mean, crucial. Crucial, crucial, crucial. And in fact, I should have, I didn't even think about adding that in the talk mm -hmm. today, but that's the other thing I think that really brought me to the Maverick work as well is because when planets hit the angles by transit or progression, or when the angles move into a new sign, they really change a person's perspective. One of the things that I really enjoy doing when I do my, um, what I call roadmap readings, because I really believe that the, um, where the, tr what the transits and the progressions are is really a roadmap of what you're going to be going through and experiencing for the next year. So one of the key things that I do is where is your ascendant, where is your descent and where's your mid heaven? Cause it's, it's kind of like where your focus is. And what's really nice about this idea of through transits and progressions is that we, while we are born inherently of that sign that is on our ascendant, through progressions, we get to experience what it's like to to have other types of um, orientation of ourselves to look out in the world in a different way that further flavors our inherent original ascendant flavor, coloring. 
Wonderful. And I think you've pretty much answered this question, but there's a lot of questions coming in in terms of the, the importance of the angles in solar returns or astrocartography. If you've got any of the planets on the, you know, ascendant, descendant, IC, MC, are you all, are you paying attention to all those planets on the angles and all these different things? Yeah, it's, it's huge. I mean, you're going to, and that's really, I think when people, and, and that's actually one of the talks I really, one of the things I like to say in my, uh, when I talk about the astrological mavericks is because there are people who don't have any planets in the same sign or on the angles. And what's really great is that every month, you get the moon hitting your angles four times every year you get the sun hitting the angles four times and then then all the other planets by transit and progression continue to hit and so we get to have these different experiences but yes wholeheartedly those are those are really crucial aspects and again that's part of what brought me to doing the astrological mavericks because i thought why aren't we and it's funny when we, I mean, maybe even some of you guys are even thinking about like, why don't we focus more on the angles in this sense? Why are, why isn't there more talk about what the angles are? I mean, it's, it's, it's very much this, um, we kind of take it for granted in the same sense as, and the image that comes to my mind is this liminal aspect of like, just literally walking through our front door. We're just so used to walking through that door. We don't even think about it anymore. Right. So again, that aspect of astrology gives us the ability to regain our observational nature and go, wait a minute, I'm moving from my outside of my house and I'm now stepping in inside. And what does that now mean? Again, what does it mean? Now my ascendant is now on my eye where in the same sign as where my IC is, you know, maybe I'm starting to be more social. Maybe I'm inviting more people over to my home. Maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm doing more talks from my home, like, like what we're doing here today. You know, so many of us are able to do these thanks to zoom. We're able to do that. So yes, definitely. Absolutely wonderful. And forgive me if we don't get to all of the questions, but Please. another yeah. one here. When a planet is conjunct an angle but occupies the house preceding it, how would that differ from a planet in the same house? Kind of ties into another question as well. So, for example, a lot of people with maybe planets near the ascendant, either above or below the ascendant, how, how do you work with that and how do you interpret that? Beautiful. I, I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier when I said when people have angles that are at the beginning or the end of the sign, that it really will involve that previous or the sign afterwards. Just for the sake of my sanity, I had to create a certain amount of framework for the talk. Otherwise, I think, I mean, for the book, otherwise I think that thousand pages would have been like a 5,000 page book because if I just really, I mean, but it just, it's really <laughs> mostly a um, a jumping off point for people to understand that there is power in this and, and to really encourage people to kind of take the baton and further understand. I didn't do anything like say with um, the nodes touching the angles, but again, that's going to be, I, I think anything that involves- and that was another, a lot of questions talking yeah. about the nodes on the angles and whether they're exactly. as important yeah. to the planets. Yeah. And so again, I think what you'll find for those of you, um, I would really highly recommend re-listening to this talk again, which is really great because it really kind of covers a lot of it. The book kind of covers it, which you can get um, electronically as well as physically, because electronically it's a lot less expensive and it doesn't take, you know, unless you got Hermione's, um, her all and everything bag where you can just carry things around with you like that. Um, it's a little bit easier with the electronic version, but um yeah, take it off and then look at it and see, you know, for those of you who have um, a node there, for those of you who have, um, you know, the other asteroids besides Chiron there. I mean, whatever you have there is going to, again, what I talked about today, what our angles are is those are our personal points in relationship to those signs. So anything around those points are going to be really highly personal and highly um, <clears throat> relatable to you. When you read about any of the archetypal histories of whatever it is, like if you read about, um, you know, if you have Mercury on one of your angles, you know, if you read about Mercury's genesis, what he did growing up and the things, you're, there's something about it, you know, learning, oh, yeah, well, my God, yeah, I've always been a trickster. You know, I, I'm the one who, you know, whatever it is, you're going to see that there are going to be these themes they are going to be playing out. And and what I love about this in this sense, and, and one of the great gifts of what astrology gives us is, and what? I don't know when I was a kid, I loved the Greek myths. I just thought, I don't know about you, but I just, it was so fun. And then to learn astrology and like, oh my God, I already know this stuff. It's like, you know, to have that kind of frame of reference. But one of the things that excited me about the myths and also disturbed me about the myths is what excited me about them is that the gods had similar foibles as us human beings. And I thought that was really cool because it really gave us this kind of ways of personalizing the gods. And that's really what the angles do. They personalize the gods for us, for ourselves. I personally, 
I don't know. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's my Neptune in the 12th house. I don't know, you know, where I get it from it, but I really want to believe in gods who don't act like human beings. <laughs> <laughs> who kind of have a larger understanding and a better concept mm. and aren't like worrying about like Zeus going around and fructifying the world, you know, having their way with anything, anything and everything they want because of the desire nature. I mean, I, I have a really hard time thinking of a deity operating on kind of the baser level of humans. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely but, love your explanations. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> but what I do like about it in the sense of it, and 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 one of the things um that I like that is said in the Bible that says that, you know, when we talk about that we were created in God's image, there is some sort of a divineness in who we are. And I think astrology gives us this wonderful opportunity to see our divine nature in a way that is so beautiful and unblemished and i know that for me as an astrologer my work is a hundred percent being a cheerleader a theme reminder and purpose reminder for people to share with them about the beautiful amazing aspect about who they are i don't believe there's such a thing as a bad chart i don't believe there's such a thing as bad aspects we don't set ourselves up for failure but when we're told, oh, this is bad or that's bad, we can compose something in our head that gives us a story that prevents us from being in relationship with certain things. And to be honest, and this is where I'm only, the only critique I have a little about some of the other house systems is this idea when people have intercepted houses and that because they have something in that intercepted house, they are not able to access it or it's harder for them to access it. I think that gives a handicap to a person and it's not important powering. So that's another aspect of for me why I look at it and that kind of thing. Also the idea and Robert Hans kind of the same way when you walk into a room and you turn a light on everyone or you walk into a room anyone who is in that room is going to feel you and see you. Or the other way that I like to think about it and when you think about intercepted houses like when you walk into someone's living room right there in the middle of the living room is a bathroom. <laughs> like what's the bathroom doing in the middle of the living room? That should really be over in this area, you know that sort of a thing. So and I apologize and I do not mean to be grandstanding because I actually see that there isn't complete value in each one of the house systems. If you think back to um, second century um, AD, there was a mistranslation uh, of Ptolemy and that's when the signs in the houses became separated. And then all the, all the formulas we've had to create for the house systems are in an attempt to make it work. And I think what's nice about each one of them, like I said earlier on, is each one of them has an appropriate lens. Like I know Porphyry they use for um, uh, evolutionary astrology. Um, Coke and um, Placidus are really great if you're a psychologist or a therapist and you want to really kind of hone in on what the emotional aspects are of it. It shows it's just a different way of having a perspective. Absolutely wonderful. Okay, and more of a philosophical question for you here. Really interesting question. So someone's saying here, I believe Dane Rudier described the angles as our, our vowels and the planets as the consonants, very similar to the uh, tetragrammaton, like the co our cosmic name. What's one practical approach we can take to bring our cosmic name out into the world in an, in a authentic and powerful way? Mm. Oh, that is really beautiful. There's a lot. And there's a rich that. question. So much. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a really blessing to that person. Did it. I was really lucky in December when well, it's a blessing. And it's also, it came at a cost, um, but I was given Erin's um, library. And so she has like all the Ridyard books and all these other things. And I'm just, I'm so excited to really dive into them very deeply because, but I love that vowels and consonants. Um, I would say first and foremost, and this is something, you know, whether we talk about the hundredth monkey, whatever it is in this sort of a sense, it's really this part of each of us claiming and owning our true nature so i think that begins fundamentally with the ascendant secondarily with the ic so um with that ascendant what i think is powerful in the liminal sense is that area above the ascendant is i perceive it as the 12th house even to be honest even with my whole house system if someone has like a 15 degree um 15 degree asc ascendant, I'm going to count that first 15 degrees as the 12th house because it's in this pre-conscious state for the individual. It's above the ascendant. So it's like, it's not quite connecting with it. So I think sitting with who we are with that ascendant, any kind of planets and building um, 
I was going to say a, a meditational practice, but the truth is meditation is done differently by many people. Some people are able to do chanting. That's their meditation. Some people are able to do silent meditation and really clear their mind. Some people a hike in nature is their meditation. Some people being with their dogs or being with the people they love. I mean, whatever it is, it really feeds you and that you really are understanding what that frequency is of you. Working on building that up so in, in sort of a sense of like, like from my core energetic background, one of the exercises would be to sit there, um, probably standing slightly with your legs, like shoulder, shoulder length apart, your feet shoulder length apart, and your knees slightly bent, and really feeling who you are in yourself, and then feeling around and stretching out to where that energy is in like how wide and how big your auric field is. Practicing that on your own, building that, and then begin to take that energy out into public. See what it's like when you carry that energy into work, seeing what that feels like when you carry that into your, your personal, your, um, your intimate relationships with your spouse, significant other, or, or children, um, holding that sort of energy, owning your own reality of what your chart is, and also being able to own and accept other people's individual um, expressions of that as well, I think are really important. Um, the other, I think that's really important. And I like to do is I like to put my, um, my left hand on my heart and my right hand out forward. And my left hand says, this is me. And my right hand is that's you and understanding that differentiation for those of us who have very mutable or water, um, angles we receive it's really easy for us to to adjust ourselves very quickly and easily for other people's energies and getting in touch with what the reality of how who we are and what our pulse is is really crucial and important um being able to if you're in situations where you are not able to share your truth with people verbally say it inside your head claim it I think is really important if, you know, it might be someone, you know, maybe it's your a parent who doesn't really ever want to hear you, doesn't ever want to really see who you really are. If it, it, you don't have to acquiesce and give it over to them, you can just say, um, I don't agree with you on the inside of your head. Like when I, 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 a prime example for me is whenever the commercial comes on and says, Hey, this is cold and cold and flu season, cold and tick season, <laughs> cold and flu season. And I immediately tell myself, no, not for me. It's that's really claiming who we are, empowering ourselves for what our truth is and finding, especially when it comes to interacting in, inter, in interpersonal relationships is how do we hold what our truth is for ourselves and not negate what another person's truth is. Um, again, going back, you know, here, my image here with Aquarius here, this is Aquarius moon, you know, with Pluto in Aquarius right now, the ideology that's happening, I mean, we're seeing it in, in, um, in, in at Gaza and, and for the between the Palestinians and the Israeli, um, um, we have to step out of this ideology. We have to be able to go like, oh, it's okay, you're different. It's okay that you know that we have many similarities. I mean, all of us here on the planet are have way more in common with one another than we don't. And um, I think that's the stuff that's going to really be coming forward, especially as the climate change happens, and we're going to need to find some way to be in better community with one another because um, the only way we're going to make it out is together. So that's that's my that's my short answer for that philosophical question. <laughs> and a beautiful and a beautiful answer as well. Thank you so much. Another Thank question you. here for the cross of yeah. incarnation. What if uh, the ICMC is not in the same modality as the ascendant descendant? I think that kind of brings up to a broader question of your thoughts of the modalities in in the angles. What general yeah. thoughts about? I I love that. I mean, in some ways, it's nice when people have it all in the same. And why we mean by what we mean by modalities is either cardinal, fixed, or mutable signs. Um, but there are times where um, you might have your ascendant descend as mutable, and then you might have your, your MC and your IC is either fixed or um, mutable. I think I said that right. Um, but they aren't necessarily going to be the same. And I think that just gives us an ability to adjust ourselves. It, it's it's kind of like, I mean, one of the other things that's really fascinating about astrology is it helps us to understand the koans of who we are. I mean, like one of my great koans, for those of you born in 1990, is um, how does Uranus conjunct Neptune in Capricorn work? 
<laughs> you know, it's these things of like these, you know, where we have these absolute, you know, understandings of things being in a certain way, but then there is like, you know, uh, you know, like a Uran, you know, like where you have Uranus and it's squaring Saturn. You're like, okay, well, every time I want to create structure, something screws it all up, you know, but you're an Aquarian. So you understand how to work with those energies. I think it's just, it just helps us to, un to, it, it, it's, it's the series of different paints and how we need to work with them. And, and as we know, it's, it's this ability to, further um integrate synthesize and cohere this amazing width and depth of wisdom that is astrology and being able to incorporate it and i think that's why um you know one of the beautiful parts of it, and yeah you can take a book and you can read a class you know take a class or read a book and you can be call it call yourself an astrologer but the truth is the longer you're in it the more you study it the more you do the more you understand the nuances how they feed with it and as well as understanding what happens when people have these sorts of placements and having be able to understand that and be able to have a frame of reference is really good because um, our books have ideas and set things in them. Sometimes they end up being really spot on, but, but for the vast majority of people, we all use our colors in different ways. And so it's really about stepping into the place of being whatever that energy is of with that person. And I think for those of you who have two different sorts of, um, angles, it just gives you the ability to plan your life in that sort of a way. You know, so like if you have a fixed mid heaven IC, then you're probably gonna have a little bit more of a structured um, home life and and um, and work life. And if you have um, mm -hmm. mutable ascendant descendant, then you're probably gonna be a little bit more wilder in your relationships with yourself and people. Absolutely wonderful. It's quite interesting in the questions we've got here. There's more questions about the descendant and the IC, which I think is the the least commonly explained or known about. So another question here, in contrast to the descendant from a psychological point, do you think the IC shows what we uh, really expect or need from others since this is where we received our first nurturing or lack of it? Beautiful, beautiful question. Yeah, in fact, that's one of the things I do talk about in my um, Mavericks talk is um, that, you know, we talk about the Ascendant and the Midheaven all the time. And Descendant comes up, of course, because we use that kind of as a frame of reference about being how what our relationship is going to be like, right? But the IC is this very fascinating, you know, we really, like I said earlier on, we really don't expect there to be much activity going on it. But then, you know, as you saw with the example that I had for um, Richard Carpenter and Ted Bundy and... Um, and Michelle Gogolin and um, and um, O.J. Simpson and Elton John, you know, that that IC really plays it out. And we have to understand, yeah, whatever that fourth house, whatever is that IC is, there's an aspect of programming and an aspect of um, familiarity, right? So there's that ways in which that that is our family. And we might want to go out in the world and recreate our family, especially if we have some strong planets there. And then when we can realize like, oh, wait, you know, I did the family thing already. I can like step out of that. But it's always, it's always going to be an, an informing a, um, I like one of the ways that Aaron Sullivan said something one time, and I thought it was very fascinating. And when we think about it, the moon is the first planet that does a full transit in 28 days and the quickest progression throughout the signs as well. Um, no, no, because that takes longer. That takes 27 years. No, yeah, well, it's quicker than other things. But in that sense, it's that moon going through and it's making those relationships with it. So when it's hitting that first, that fourth house, that's that early, early stuff. And it's that's the earliest programming. So the, it's almost like that first time of the record being laid, you know, like back at the way vinyl would be, you know, kind of made. It's like that first track of that moon going through its cycle, that first 28 days of life is, is basically setting the theme for how that is. And it does have that resonance on with the fourth house because of cancer, um, because of the inherent cancer aspect of them being ruled by the moon down there too. So yeah, I would always say that as well. Wonderful. Trying to reword some of these qu common questions here. What would you say in terms of, of synastry in those that with Two people maybe have planets that heavily on the angles. Do they kind of attract each other or repel? I mean, what are your thoughts in terms of the dynamics between uh, people? I really, really, I really love that because actually that was one of the things that I found with, with my research, research on the Mavericks is that birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> um, one of the things that I think about people who have plants in the angles is there is just a level of intensity and people who don't have it 
feel it and can be very intimidated by it. So those of you who do have planets in the same sign as your angles, chances are your other friends also have angular planets as well. And one of the examples, I mean, like, again, like I said earlier, I have a Scorpio moon. Um, so one of those things that, you know, Scorpios always get told, I'm a night birth, um, is that um, uh, you're so intense. And so what's really great is when you get older, what's really nice to realize is when someone says, uses those kind of code words like that, which is in some ways demeaning or gaslighting, what they're kind of telling you is that they're really not your peeps. And it might be one of those where you, I, I kind of call it, our lives are really about having friendships that are about concentric circles, the inner circle. Um, <laughs> and I always laugh about this again, you know, Scorpio moon. So I've got that kind of sense of humor, but um, you know, the one you can call like two o'clock in the morning and they'll say, yeah, where do you want me? And do I need to bring my shovel? <laughs> you know, and then everyone else kind of has in, in concentric circles out from there. So, you know, it's, it's people who earn that right, earn that ability to understand how it is. And um, I think having, those of us who have strong personalities, it's really good to have other strong personalities around us because not only can we hear them better because they can actually break through to us in a certain way, but they're actually willing to say things to us and risk in a way that other people might not feel comfortable doing. Absolutely. Like an example, the Royal family. I mean, that was one of my, my thing. In fact, yeah, the Royal family is like, is a good group of it. Uh, the Manson family, um, Charles Manson and his, and his women, they all have uh, strong angular planets. I mean, it's really, it, it really plays out for who we draw and who we have around us. Absolutely. I, I love how you explain everything. So there's kind of a question I'm kind of merging into others, but in terms of personal planets, say versus outer planets, transiting the angles, and particularly if you've got, you know, retrograde motion when it's coming back, hitting those angles, um, your, your thoughts, again, are the difference between maybe the personal planets hitting the angles and the outer planets, what in your experiences, how does that maybe transform or manifest for the native? Sure. Well, I, I like to think of transits as being kind of like a triggering point, something that's getting activated. And um, like I said earlier on, when um, the angles really make whatever their whatever is their personal. So whether it's a an, a personal planet like you and I have with Mars, which, you know, we kind of have that kind of a personal relationship with it anyway, I think it heightens it even more. But when it comes to the outer planets, um, especially by transit, it, it, you know, and, and the one that comes to my mind, especially is Uranus, because it's just, there's, there's going to be some sort of a shock. I mean, I had a friend of mine, um, I wish she had told me, I mean, I don't know what I could have done for him to be honest, but he had a really strong thing where um, I can't remember if he has Mars on his ascendant or something, but he had transiting Uranus on his ascendant. Well, he just got, he got out of work one day and he was just really grumpy about something wanted to let off some steam. It was in his motorcycle. He floored it. He went through a four-way stop sign without stopping and came to, you know, was aware of his body flying through the air. <laughs> so i mean especially i think when you have uranus on it i mean it's it's there's going to be a shock and when when uranus gives you an accident it's because you really typically haven't been paying attention and it's it's one of these things where i think we have, we can have a little bit of hubris as astrologers and say like oh well you know if you did this this would have resolved it because we don't ever understand what a person's willingness is or where they are in their continuum of what they need but i often find that um certain times in life and especially when uh, outer planets are um, conjuncting any of the angles, we're going to be seeing strong representations of that in the person's life. Absolutely. Like Neptune, uh, Neptune hitting the IC, um, you get a flooding in your, I mean, I, I can't even tell you how many times we've had friends talk about, oh yeah, you know, our downstairs toilet flooded, you know, or, you know, the, the shower came up or, um, and then you're honest on the IC, of course. I mean, how many people move? I mean, it's like like if I had a dime for every person who moved when it happened, I mean, it's like there's something, it, it, it needs a place. And if you don't do those things with it, you need to, um, it's funny because I was talking to someone from Russia a couple of years ago and they were talking about the difference of how Americans 
do astrology versus how they do it. And she was talking about this thing, that almost like Vedic cures. Like she would say, like when you had like a, like a big Scorpio thing coming through, you'd kind of maybe want to have like a pet tarantula for a while or something that's like really bringing in that energy to the house. So it's kind of like focusing on that. And, and I would say that as well, you know, one of our sayings in astrology is you either work with the planets unconsciously I mean, they work with you unconsciously or you get to work with them consciously. So a lot of us who have these powerful placements, what's really nice about becoming an astrologer is we get to have those Uranians and those Plutonians and those Neptunians come through our door as clients and not have that happening in our relationships. Absolutely. I don't want a tarantula in my house. Anyway, next question. Yeah. Uh, all, <laughs> all the, the fire air. Uh, Maybe a scorpion then. <laughs> so, yeah, so you <laughs> Again, more of a uh, societal philosophical question. Are the, the fire air polarities easier to manifest in our times, given our value systems in society, I presume Western society, than the water earth uh, signs? Uh, curious about your opinion. I think society has ways in which it rewards certain ways of being, certain ways of being, and then there are way, other ways that are um, that are not seen appropriately. Are um, and when we think about it, like the DSM, I don't even know what number it is in psychology at this point, but um, you know when we think about psychoses that we have or where we have um, um, these these chronic. Um, God, my mind's completely blanking on the word for it because I just, I don't like the idea of it. It's this idea of labeling people's name and staying in it. It's this opportunity to be able to see that we, that we are greater than that. And, and I think it really comes down to more, sorry, that went off into a whole different framework of thought, but getting back to your question, I think it really has to do more with the individual wearing those energies and the, um, the authenticity, you know, how strong their Saturn process is in them for who, for them to be who they are. Um, astrology shows us if, if we were to line up every single person in line from the moment of, you know, each, each of us in, at, from the moment of our birth, we get to see the expression of the universe. And so that's why I really think every single one of us, it's so crucial for us to be our own archetype. We are we are a holistic archetype made up of a sum of innumerable other archetypes and astrology helps us to understand that. And so I think the water and the earth, because they're magnetic, um, there's a way that they can hold themselves together in a way that is really easy, but we've now moved into the great mutation thanks to Jupiter and Saturn now in the air signs. So I think this physicality is going to be stepping away a little bit. But I also think because of more of the preponderance of the air and fire, that the need for the earth and the water people is going to be even greater. I have like 85 planets in earth. <laughs> so, and, you know, in astrology, those of us with earth are really rare because, <laughs> you know, usually if people are lucky, they usually have a planet in earth and it often ends up being Chiron, which already tells you kind of like what the position of what earth is in a person's chart. But um, I think it's, it's, again, it's that aspect of practice. I know for me, um, it was really important for me going and doing the core energetics, which is basically this understanding of um, the uh, integration of our, of our soul and our body together, as well as the importance of grounding here on planet earth. And um, I think a lot of astrological ideas can become very airy and very ungrounded and, you know, however we can do these things. That's why it's kind of fun in the beginning to start with kind of an orientation of where we are on the planet for what the, um, the grand vertical and the grand circle are to be able to give us an orientation of who we are in relationship to time and space. And so, again, I think it just behooves each of us to do our work you know it's that hundredth monkey stuff you know all of us thank thank you all for taking the time today thank you all bless you all for the luxury that you have in your life that you have the time to be able to set aside to be able to read this watch this to study astrology to bring understanding understanding is what's going to save us as humanity and to be honest every single one of the elements is necessary in that regard Absolutely beautiful, absolutely beautiful response. So, Michael, thank you so much for an extensive Q&A. Absolutely amazing. And again, such a beautiful presentation. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today all around the world, different time zones. We love, we absolutely love our worldwide community. And just to reiterate, we'll have this replay on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Uh, I'm thinking probably Monday noon, noon Eastern, around that time. But yeah, around that time, anyway. <laughs> So thank you all so much for, for tuning in and uh, absolutely brilliant questions today. And I apologize 
we didn't get to everybody's questions, but uh, thank you all so much again. And thank you, Michael. As yeah, well. feel free. Anyone who wants to, you know, email me if you have a question and feel like it got to. I also do Maverick readings. Thank you all for the loves and the hearts and the stuff. Just thank you all. What a, what a beautiful, beautiful gift to be with here with you today. Just There's so many coming through. Blessings. I can't even see the screen anymore. I can't see the writing. <laughs> Wonderful. Beautiful. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, like I say, go to the YouTube channel. You can check that out in the replay in the next few days. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks, Michael. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye, Laurie. Thank you. Bye, Cal. Thank you. Bye.